you know, if the, even if the film didn't didn't make it in a Sundance, it still would be out there, still would be a, a historical record. So people maybe in, let's say even Russian people who maybe in one year or in 10 years would really like to know what, what happened, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what they have done, even Ukrainians. So that would be just out there for people to see as a historical document. So all that in mind, I uh, went as far as possible. Welcome to Bitch Talk. I'm Aaron Lim. This is Ange, a.k.a. Captain Party. And I'm producer Shar. And over the last 10 years, we've been elevating marginalized voices through interviews and events, sometimes over a glass of whiskey. Welcome to day five of our Slam Dance and Sundance Film Festival coverage. Today, we're featuring documentaries on recent issues in the U.S. and around the world. We have Food and Country with returning director Laura Gabbert and 20 Days in Mariupol, which won the Sundance World Cinema Documentary Competition Audience Award. A big thank you to 48 Hills and our listeners for voting us Best of the Bay Best Podcast. And now on with the show. All right, we are on the Festival Daily <clears throat> Buzz. Uh, taping at Treasure Mountain Inn at the top of Main Street in Park City, talking to films about Sundance that are at Sundance and Slam Dance. My name is John Wildman. I'm the editor in chief of FilmsGoneWild.com with my bitch talk team, Angela Tabora and Aaron Lim. And on this segment, we're going to talk about the documentary Food and Country, screening at Sundance. We have with us the director, Laura Gabbert. Laura, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Uh, I know we've we've got questions. Um, because we love this movie. Um, <laughs> why don't you introduce our audience? They have not seen the film as yet. Okay, yeah. Tell us about Food and Country. Yeah, I, I will give you the top line. How about that? And then we can get deeper into it because it covers a lot. Um, so Food and Country is essentially a film about the people behind our food, right? The people who grow and make our food. And for Ruth Reichel and I, who we collaborated on it, she's the, you know, she's written for food about 50 years former New York Times restaurant critic, editor of Gourmet, she came to me and was very concerned about what was happening to our farmers and ranchers and restaurant owners at the very beginning of the pandemic. We talked in March 2020. Mm -hmm. And I had been thinking about covering something just about restaurants. And she said, Laura, this, is, this could be devastating for the entire food system. And it's also going to really lay bare what's wrong with our food system. Mm -hmm. And there might be an opportunity to fix it, Right. Or we might be left with a completely industrialized food system. Mm -hmm. So she took it as this sort of moment to want to record as much as she could. So she went out and she just reached out to everyone she knew. And one person would lead her to the next person. And because it was early in the pandemic, we just decided to record the Zoom calls, thinking that it was more R&D. Right. Like, because at that point, remember, we didn't know how long the pandemic was going to last. Oh, a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're like, let's just start and see what happens. Right. Mm -hmm. And it went on and on and on and on. And so we started getting some remote shooters to go out and shoot safely. Um, and once we each had one shot in our arms, we got our crew together and kind of went mm -hmm. out and really spent time on the ground um, with this group of people, about 10 characters. Um, and actually more than that in the editing process, we, you know, process, we winnowed it down, of course. So long answer, but <laughs> no, that, that, was, that was perfect. And you and Ruth teaming up is just such a powerhouse team. Um, as our listeners hopefully know, you, you, this is not your first film about food. We had you on Bitch Talk about six years ago for City of Gold right. on the late, late great Jonathan Gold. Yeah. Um, and now you're going from very micro to macro <laughs> in terms of the <laughs> food industry. <laughs> yeah. So how to uh, talk about kind of the overwhelmingness of just talking about restaurants alone yeah. is already a lot. Already and now lot. you're talking about everything that is encompassed in what we eat. Yeah. And I think that was obviously you know, won't surprise anyone. One of the challenges of making the food, how do we focus it? What's it really about? You know, that's what you're constantly asking as a filmmaker. What is this film really about? And we just decided to really tell this story. We had to kind of do this panoramic, you know, story where you jump all over the country because that's what Ruth was doing in the pandemic. She was talking to people in Georgia and then she was talking to people in Nebraska and then on both coasts and, and she was trying to connect the dots. And, um, yeah, the hardest the hardest piece was like we're taking this sort of snapshot 
of a system um, that has been hobbled, right, by really bad policymaking, mm -hmm. intentional, mm -hmm. intentional mm -hmm. bad policy. It's mm -hmm. not, people like to say these things were sort of unintended consequences. These were conscious decisions mm -hmm. people in power made about our food system, right? Um, which has just led to a complete uh, consolidation, right? So, which has happened in so many other industries as well. So it's kind of a story about that, mm -hmm. at its essence, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then, you know, there were lots of decisions. Do we include this storyline? Do we cover this issue? Are we going to get into immigration? Are we going to get into, yeah. you know, the history of tipping? You know, all these mm. things, oh. mm -hmm. mm. right? So, um, and I think for us, when we felt like we had landed on things that I'm sure food policy people know all about this, but most Americans don't really understand it. Whenever we had aha moments, we were like, okay, I think this has to be in the film. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a little detour <laughs> and we're going to do a quick little, quick little history of this. And then we're going to go back to our present day characters and current day stories unfolding. Mm -hmm. um, I love Marcus Samuelson. So yeah. thank you for adding him. And also um, what a nice surprise to meet Karen Washington <gasps> during this filming. Mm -hmm. um, what did you learn? He's arriving today. <gasps> oh, <laughs> oh, okay. She's great. All of our subjects are, are going to be here. Oh, what? Okay. We need to add some yeah. interviews for the day. <laughs> and they haven't met each other. And Ruth has, <gasps> never, has only met a handful of them in person. So they're all going to meet tonight at our condo, which is really beautiful. Amazing. I have yeah. so many more questions. But um, can you talk about uh, urban farming and what, and what you learned about it through this process? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Karen Washington is, is an interesting example because she is a farmer and activist, right? Mm -hmm. And she's been doing it since the 80s. She was like way ahead of her time. She had one of the first urban gardens in the South Bronx. Um, she has a farm in upstate New York uh, that she uses for educational purposes, but also to grow food and bring it back to her neighborhood in the South Bronx mm -hmm. and show people and educate people about what good nourishing food is. Um, mm -hmm. So her mission is largely educational, you know? Um, and yeah, it was just kind of, you know, I think a lot of us, that's something that I learned during the pandemic. I didn't know the history of black farming in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, white farmer, white farmers control 98% of the farmland. Mm -hmm. And that didn't be the, that didn't used to be the case. And our government systematically took that land away from them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And before that, we took it away from indigenous people, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So, There's a theme. <laughs> it's yeah. a theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The film offers a fascinating dichotomy of a vast array of people that gave me great hope in what they're doing, mm -hmm. whether uh, farming, ranching, mm -hmm. urban farming, even Ruth, uh, you, know, you know, and and yet also being so frustrated on their behalf, going, we need to get them help. We need to get them some freaking help. Yeah. Um, I would love for you to talk about which which which, which you started touching on a little bit, um, kind of wrestling this darn thing to the ground. Yeah. And in, in you know and how you started and you know and not knowing if it's just you know you know you know. How, what kind of film right. this would be and how, because there's so much information for us to take in. Yeah. And yet it's also a call to action documentary. So, so it's, you know, so it's not just a history of, and mm -hmm. here, but, but it's also, we need to fix some stuff. Yeah. We still can. So talk about that process of, of, of mapping out the timeline of your documentary and either mm -hmm. dropping in footage or, or mm -hmm. changing midstream. Okay. Talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think every filmmaker says, says this about their films. That this was an incredibly difficult film to edit. It took us a long time with breaks in between for raising more money and reassessing and do the Zoom calls work? Is it cinematic enough? I mean, my gut from the beginning was that um, was that I thought there was something actually special that happened in the Zoom calls because. Once you are liberated from that traditional model of the one camera in a room with lights and making sure the room looks pretty, it, it it's a whole different tone and feeling. And we had these sort of spontaneous conversations in the moment with Ruth and a farmer face to face, you know, week to week or month to month. So as soon as a farmer learns that perhaps they didn't get a contract, we're getting the immediate reaction. Whereas in a more traditional, traditionally made documentary, you might get that months later. Mm -hmm. and have to say, what did it feel like when this happened, right? So there was this kind of, I was like, this is, we have to lean into this. Like, let's not be afraid of it, right? Because people are like, oh, Zoom on in movies is a killer. Mm -hmm. 
and it is hard, you know, it's like, it's not particularly cinematic, but I feel like um, it's emotionally cinematic, right? Because you get these kind of very personal, um, in intimate conversations. But that's not answering your question. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I've loved everything that you said. Okay. Yes. Um, and then the process for editing was really just, you know, we had a four hour cut in the beginning because we had other really wonderful characters that we wanted to include, even some of the characters that are there briefly, like Brandon Jew and Marcus Samuelson mm -hmm. and Nick mm -hmm. Kakonis and, and Grant Akats. You know, they had amazing storylines and, you know, and we just had to hone in and like get it to be about a hundred minutes. And that mm -hmm. was just really cutting and recutting and recutting and trying it with this character and then taking it out and then saying, well, can this character handle this character? And can one, can a character appear once in this film? Does that work? Are we breaking a rule? Okay. Cause we had that rule in the beginning and we're, we're going to break that rule for these two characters. It, you know, it, it just was a process of just seeing how it felt. Right. Because I really wanted this film to be not a sort of policy driven graphics mm. oriented film. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Because and, and those films are great. We need them. But because Ruth was there talking to these people and connecting with them, we wanted to be more emotional. Like you want to get to know Lee Jones. You want to get to know mm -hmm. Angela Knuth in Nebraska and mm -hmm. how she's dealing with her husband and her sons. Mm -hmm. And you want to like. So we tried to like give just enough context historical context without like too many facts and figures because i think that's what changes people's minds right is like caring about those people and being like oh wait okay i get my vegetables here let's see yep. where does it come from right because 80 percent of the food in our supermarkets is is grown and produced by about four or five companies. Right. That was startling to hear. And I, I believe it was the rancher that was saying the the meat industry, two of the four leading companies are not even here in the States. Right. Yeah. That was, yeah. But but I, I'm glad you brought that up because I did love hearing from the farmers and the ranchers because living in a big city, we're big advocates for restaurant workers' rights and sure. tipping well yeah. and, and um, you know, care. safe safety in the kitchen and mm -hmm. things like that. But the, the farmers, they live such different lives lives from us. Yeah. It's so nice to see that it's so much more than Republican, Democrat. It's like, no, they just want to put food on the table and work hard for good products. I mean, I, I honestly feel like at least one of my takeaways, and I hope other people's have this takeaway, is that this is a bipartisan issue. Mm -hmm. Like it, once you start talking about food and how it's grown in this country, I mean, unless you're talking to Cargill, you know, or like, mm -hmm. you know, but if you talk to people who are actually making it and growing it, people in the red states and blue states agree. It transcends that stuff. Um, you know, we have staunch Republicans in our film mm -hmm. and you find that Ruth and these characters just connect because they share the same values about, you know, paying people properly for the food they grow. Right. Taking care of the land, <laughs> you know, and making sure, you know, you know, people have nutritious food to eat. Well, I would say, again, th this is one of those documentaries that um, uh enlightening, fascinating, sometimes very frightening. Um, and I'm, as someone who does a lot of regional film festivals, mm -hmm. I hope you will have an extensive tour with this thing. Oh yeah, uh, I know. That would be great, mm -hmm. right? Like all over America? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. Again, the title of the film is Food and Country, uh, which is screening at Sundance. We've been talking with the director, Laura Gabbert. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. Really appreciate Thank you. It. This episode is made possible by Ann Wang, Natalie Gamble, the Papa Lowdown Agency, the Friesen Family, Jenny Yang, Fleetwood, aka Nico, Melanie Pena, Lauren Lim, Catherine Tulio, Courtney Kita, Mila Blog, Anita Tabora Rodriguez, Arabella DeLuco, Chloe Jackman of Chloe Jackman Studios, Shauna Festi, Stephanie Walton, Lisa Shad, Antoinette Tabora, and Storied San Francisco. Thank you so much for donating, and a special shout out to the Slam Dance Film Festival for providing us a recording home in Park City. We're on the Festival Daily Buzz. Here we are with Angela Tabora and Aaron Lim from Bitch Talk. My name is John Wildman. I'm the editor-in-chief of FilmsGoneWild.com. 
here at the Treasure Mountain Inn at Sundance. And on this segment, we're going to be talking about the film 20 Days of Mariupol, which is screening at Sundance. We have the director, Ukrainian AP video journalist, Mstislav Chernov. Mstislav, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, we uh, our audience has not had a chance likely to see the film as yet, so introduce us to the film. Uh, so, 20 Days in Mariupol tells the story of 20 days, uh, starting on 24th of February with a full-scale invasion of Russia and Ukraine, which has actually started in 2014, uh, but not in such a huge scale. And uh, it's the film focuses on um, the beginning of the siege of Mariupol, one of the most important and symbolic battles uh, in during this year, during this invasion. And it is told through perspective of journalists. However, the main focus of it is a story of the city, of the destruction and the suffering of its residents. So we see how, in this film, we see how city... Uh, quickly spiraling down as it gets surrounded we can see how it's quickly spiraling down into the darkness how people start panicking how they lose their relatives loved ones and how we who we as a journalist struggle with sending important material as mm -hmm. maternity hospital bombing um, children being killed and doctors trying to save them uh, all of those shots which probably uh, Many people in the world have already seen that has been shown in UN and uh, US Congress. However, those were broken in very, very small pieces. Mm -hmm. So with the film, you could really see a scale and really how much these people suffered. There is a, a tremendous amount of suffering in this film because it is war. Um, but I found that there was... Um, hope in the film as well with your relationship with Vladimir. I wanted to know if you can talk more about that. There are moments of levity. And the, the beauty is that uh, we didn't even need to think about, you know, when do we bring this levity? When do we bring this tragedy? Uh, it just naturally progresses through these 20 days as film built on day one, day two, the, the, as a countdown. Sometimes you encounter this these moments of levity. And um, as I say in a film, the the war brings the best and the worst in people. Mm -hmm. So people really, there are people who really help us, like that policeman Vladimir who uh, helped us to get the connection when we really needed to send the important footage. He uh, ultimately helped us to to get out, risking his own life and uh, mm -hmm. safety of his own family. Uh, there are other moments, uh, small moments, but which they will they give hope and i think that's what actually inspired the world when the world looks at ukraine and how ukrainians fight this war that's what inspiring they didn't give up mm -hmm. they they kept fighting and uh they um they try uh, as good as possible to stay alive and to support each other that's what i'm trying to show there too mm -hmm. Yes, it, that was very clear. Um, it, and it's it's a little hard to talk about this film with you because, first of all, congratulations, you made it to Sundance. It's a great, greatly made film. But also this film is so much bigger than a film festival. Mm -hmm. I wish that, you know, in order to enter Park City, you have to watch this film. It should be mandatory viewing. <laughs> um, but, but I want to know how you switch something in your brain to be able to do this work. When you see people running from something, you run towards it. How, how do you switch something in your brain to, to allow you to do that? In a war zone, you mean? Mm -hmm. Look, so the film, again, the film tells tells the story of Ukrainians and Ukrainian city. And I am Ukrainian. Our team is Ukrainian. So it is also our story. Uh, it's a, uh, We are part of that community. And so as a journalist, but also as a Ukrainian, I do feel obliged to, to do my own part in at least uh, recording potential war crimes mm -hmm. recording for for the history um, what really happened to a city because 
you know, if the, even if the film didn't didn't make it in a Sundance, it still would be out there, still would be a, a historical record. So people maybe in, let's say even Russian people who maybe in one year or in 10 years would really like to know what, what happened, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what they have done. They, they would have this record, but also people who might have missed it in US or in Europe, even Ukrainians. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would be just out there for people to see as a historical document. So all that in mind, I uh, went as far as possible to do, to do that. You know, um, there are several times in the film where, of course, people are panicked, they're, um, they're, 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 they're in shock, and they're lashing out at you mm. for having a camera. And <clears throat> why, why are you filming this? And, you know, and, and why aren't you doing something? And who are you? And, and so those moments, um, as a journalist, um, as a documentarian, where it is vitally important for you to document, but it's also difficult to separate the emotions uh, itself. And I would love for you to, to talk about it because, you know, it's one of those things where watching the film, um, you know, we're devastated by what we're looking at. You were right there um, within, within reaching distance of that. And yet, so to speak, you, I mean, literally, you have a job to do. So talk about what, what, was, you know, what would be going through your head, you know, throughout that process. Well, first of all, those people who didn't want to be on camera, who told me, don't film me, uh, they are not on camera. We don't see them in the film. Those people who are talking to me, but they're just angry. I thought that it's quite important to show. And one of the <clears throat> one of the ideas and one of the important things for me when I was um, working with Michelle Meissner with the frontline uh, editor, when we were building a narrative of this film, it was important for us to to give the audience a chance to experience all kinds of all kinds of reactions that we encounter. We see people who are swearing or mm -hmm. we see people who are coming to us and saying, please film me. I really hope my relatives will see me uh, on the TV and know I'm alive. And there are actually much more people like that. Uh, in a film, there is only one person, but there are dozens and dozens of people who just came to us and please film us. Mm -hmm. Other people come and say, please film this chaos so the world knows and so the world does something there are doctors who just inviting us and, and asking us please film uh, these crimes and show this to putin so there and there are people who are really hoping Mariupol stays ukrainian city there are people who are blaming the ukrainian army for some reason for bombing them so i wanted to show this confusion and i wanted to be fair that's the point i wanted to be fair uh, to everyone. And then the follow-up to that is because uh, even at the end, we, we, we see how literally the footage, um, you know, that, that, that you secured um, is being uh, mm -hmm. um, dismissed as fake. And, you know, and in this country, we, you know, we, um, we certainly have that debate of supporting Ukraine or not. And, you know, and there, and there is a very uh, strong political faction that, um, you know, that, that parrots Russian Federation uh, talking points and whatever. And one of the things they, they immediately go to is all this footage we see is fake. Um, I have to imagine, I, you know, again, as, as, as any filmmaker, um, that's tough to hear and that's tough to combat. But in, especially in this case, because you were there and, you know, and, and, and you know, you know, you, you, because you were there, you know what you saw. Can you talk about emotionally I mean, you know, here we're at Sundance, and 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 and, and we are, we're, we're, we've got a big audience for this film, and and, that's good. and as Angela said, hopefully, we will get a bigger audience for this film, but still, you're a person, mm -hmm. and you know, and 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 so, talk about again, you know, how how you handle hearing that. Uh, I'll start with this. So there's another film premiering at the Sundance, another Ukrainian film, very important film, Iron Butterflies, and it tells the story about MH17 downing, right? About this airplane downing by Russia. 
So I've been there. I was one of the first international. I always get in trouble. You see. <laughs> I was one of the first. I was one of the first journalists who arrived like half an hour after the after the crash of the May seventeen, mm. and uh, it was terrible. It was just terrible. Uh, that's another conversation. Um, but what I'm saying is that that in 2014, with that, a campaign started. It's a very similar campaign actually to what happened to Mariupol. That's why I feel the connection between. Iron Butterflies and 20 Days mm. in Mariupol. Because, and that campaign you know, went on for, for years. Uh, the campaign to interpret these images, this this crash, this downing of this plane in a completely different way. Mm. Not what the actual international courts say and prove. So when <clears throat> the, the most kind of important uh, event i would say uh the most shocking event happened in mariupol the the bombing of the maternity hospital the one which uh, propaganda russian propaganda kind of s s centered around uh, and denied and you see that in the film uh, how this happens while filming that moment, seeing seeing the medics and police carrying mm. that woman and mm -hmm. seeing how shocking that image is and seeing how iconic that image is, I was already kind of thinking, oh my God, same thing is going to happen as happened to MH17. So later on, when, when we got a call uh, over the satellite phone, when I got connected to my editors a day after, and they said, well, there's this whole campaign by Russian officials claiming you are information terrorists, claiming that it's all been staged, that this is a Hollywood production, and that AP brought a, a film crew and actors to to Mariupol. When that happened, that didn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> I felt bad for, for for these women because they were called actors. Mm -hmm. But I personally was prepared, and as AP journalist, and well, as a journalist, my job is not to argue with any propaganda, whatever it says. My job is just keep doing whatever I do, mm -hmm. and just keep delivering people the information and whatever I see. Therefore, whenever when you see in a film that we go and actually search for those pregnant women, for those survivors, it's not because propaganda said something is because uh, we needed to follow up the story. That's what the journalists do. They they find their, and they find people who they filmed, who they spoke to, and they just follow up with the story, with the important one. So no, I, we, I'm not trying to fight propaganda. I feel bad, but that's fine. It, it happens. Uh, we just keep work. Well, you know, keep, I mean, and, keep and, up work. And we have we have to wrap this up. But I do. I, and and now that you mentioned that, I do want to say that uh, journalism itself is under attack in this country in a major way, if not the entire world. Um, and there's obviously a reason what we're talking about is the reason why journalism is under attack. And, you know, and, and, you know, while, you know, what we're doing is we're talking about movies and entertainment and stuff like that. Technically we're journalists, um, but we are not you. And this is one of those cases where this doesn't always happen with us, um, but this is one of those cases where I think the three of us uh, sit here in awe of the fact that you've done what you've done, that you made it through, and that you're here, and uh, and it's just fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we've been talking about 20 Days in Mariupol, documentary screening at Sundance. We've been talking to the director and Ukrainian AP video journalist, Mr. Slav Chernov. It's really been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on today's show. You can find more information about this episode in our show notes. If you're missing us, you can visit us at bitchtalkpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter and buy us a cup of coffee. Did you know we're also on the radio? You can find us at bff.fm. And lastly, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Only the coolest bitches are doing it.
This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.